Module 4, The 60s and 70s. Detroit's Compact Challenge. Once upon a time in Detroit, the land of large and luxurious automobiles, a little bug began buzzing around. That bug, my dear automotive enthusiasts, was the Volkswagen Beetle. It wasn't just another car, it was a sign of changing times and shifting consumer demands. So grab your gears and let's dive into this fascinating story of underdogs, innovation, and survival in the automobile world. Enter the Beetle. The post-World War II era witnessed the United States dominating the automobile industry. In this world of grandeur, where bigger often meant better, Detroit's big three, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, reigned supreme, producing massive and plush vehicles that catered to America's prosperous and aspirational society. Then, from across the Atlantic, came the Volkswagen Beetle. Simple, affordable, and fuel-efficient, the Beetle was the antithesis of what Detroit was selling. The Beetle's success lay not just in its quirky design, but in its ability to answer a segment of the market that craved simplicity, affordability, and good gas mileage. The Beetle wasn't trying to be the best, it was trying to be different. And different it was. By the late 1950s and 60s, it had become a symbol of counterculture and was making serious inroads into the American market. Detroit's response. The big three couldn't just swat this bug away. Recognizing the challenge, Detroit began its foray into producing compact and subcompact cars. Here's a quick drive down that lane. The Chevrolet Corvair, GM's answer to the Beetle was unique, with its rear-mounted, air-cooled engine. However, its early models had handling issues which, combined with negative publicity, stymied its potential. Ford Falcon, Ford took a more conventional approach with the Falcon. Affordable and simple, it found considerable success and arguably came closest to answering the Beetle's challenge. Plymouth Valiant, Chrysler's contender in the compact market was technologically innovative and became popular among consumers looking for reliability and performance. While Detroit's early compacts did capture the attention of many Americans, they weren't quite the Beetles they were hoping to produce. In many cases, these cars either tried too hard to be different or weren't different enough. Detroit's dance with innovation. Amidst this competition, Detroit managed a significant victory over its overseas competitors, especially the Japanese. Enter the minivans. The idea was ingenious. Offer families a vehicle that combined the spaciousness of a van with the driving experience of a car. The result? An instant hit. For over a decade, Detroit's minivans ruled the roost, with competitors struggling to catch up. Remembering Studebaker. Now, while the Beatles' challenge in Detroit's response shaped the industry's direction, it's essential to glance back at a moment from 1966, the bankruptcy of Studebaker. While Studebaker's downfall might seem like a relic from another era, it left an indelible mark on the psyche of Detroit's executives. By the time the Great Recession rolled around in 2009, memories of Studebaker's demise remained vivid. Many in Detroit were convinced that no modern car company could survive bankruptcy. That perception influenced decisions during the economic downturn, with companies and policymakers alike determined to avoid the fate of Studebaker. Youthful classics of 60s. Ah, the 1960s and 1970s, a time of wild experimentation, revolutionary movements, and let's not forget, some seriously groovy cars. If there's one thing that could rile up the spirit of rebellion and freedom in the youth of this era, other than a certain mop-topped British band, it was the allure of a flashy sports car or a roaring muscle car. The road to classic. When you think of the 60s and 70s, you might picture flared pants, bell bottoms, and free spirits. Cars from this period mirrored the character of these decades, loud, colorful, rebellious. But why did some become classics and others mere footnotes? The answer often lay in a car's ability to tap into the zeitgeist of the time. Designs, marketing, pop culture integration, and a sprinkle of luck all played pivotal roles. Mustang, the poster child of cool. Ah, the Mustang. No, not the wild horse, though that's related, as you'll see, but Ford's brainchild, a car that felt like youth bottled and put on wheels. Its success is a masterclass in how to win the hearts of youngsters and make grown-ups wish they were young again. Firstly, the Mustang was the right size, small and sporty, perfect for the youth who wanted agility over the sheer enormity. Its price tag didn't require one to break a bank, ensuring youngsters could actually afford it without raiding their entire college funds. The name Mustang cleverly invoked images of the untamed Wild West, freedom, independence, and a little rebellious streak. Who wouldn't want a piece of that? especially in an era where breaking from tradition and carving one's own path was the order of the day. Ford, with its savvy sense of the times, didn't just stop at creating a great car. They embarked on a genius marketing spree. Recognizing the magnetic pull of music, they sponsored folk music concerts. Suddenly, the Mustang wasn't just a car, it was a vibe, man. 
It was associated with the beats and harmonies that defined a generation. And if music was the Mustang serenade, cinema was its epic ballad. Who could forget the 1968 movie Bullet with Steve McQueen? That car chase scene, my friends, wasn't just a chase, it was a dance. The roaring engine, the precise turns, the sheer thrill of it all. It was cinematic gold and firmly etched the Mustang as the car of dreams. Beyond the Mustang, the era's other icons. While the Mustang was the golden child, the era was peppered with other automotive legends. Chevrolet's Camaro, with its fierce rivalry with the Mustang, was like the Beatles to the Stones, different flavors of cool for different fans. Dodge gave us the Charger, a beast under the hood and a stunner on the streets. Its design screamed power, and it delivered just that. It was like the rock and roll of cars, loud and unapologetic. And let's not forget Pontiac's GTO, often credited as the pioneer of the muscle car movement. Its name might have been borrowed from Ferrari, a cheeky move, but its identity was all American, bold and free. Cultural waves and their four-wheeled counterparts. What led these models to become classics wasn't just about horsepower or design, it was the spirit they embodied. The 60s and 70s were about challenging the status quo, about individuality and freedom. These cars, with their aggressive designs and marketing campaigns that tapped into the heartbeats of the era, became symbols of that ethos. Auto safety, Nader, environment. The 1960s brought with it an era of significant change in various fields. Among those echoing the call for change was Ralph Nader, an advocate who highlighted the overlooked area of automobile safety, the emerging concerns. With the advent of modern cars, roads became a symbol of freedom and adventure. However, beneath the allure of these machines were growing safety and environmental concerns. With designs that sometimes prioritized aesthetics over safety, the highways started becoming treacherous terrains for many. It was becoming evident that the need for a champion in this space was dire. Ralph Nader, the advocate of safety. Ralph Nader, armed with a law degree from Harvard and a deep concern for public well-being, took upon himself the task to highlight these shortcomings. Though he didn't have the traditional trappings of a hero, his dedication and commitment made him one in the eyes of many. Unsafe at any speed, an eye-opener. In 1965, Nader's Unsafe at Any Speed hit the bookstores. This wasn't just a book, it was an expose on the automobile industry's apparent neglect of safety measures. Through detailed analysis, Nader demonstrated how, in certain cases, profitability seemed to overshadow passenger safety. And which car was at the center of this critique? The Chevrolet Corvair, which due to its design flaws, became emblematic of the larger issues in the industry. Reverberations in the auto world. The revelations weren't taken lightly. Instead of addressing the concerns, certain factions tried to discredit Nader. But true to his mission, he persisted, leading to undeniable changes in both public perception and industry practices. Legislative changes. The issues highlighted by Nader didn't just stay on the pages of his book. They translated into tangible change. In 1966, spurred by the concerns raised, the United States Congress passed the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act. This was a landmark step in ensuring vehicles were equipped with necessary safety features, making roads safer for all. Beyond human safety, environmental concerns. It wasn't just about human safety. The cars of that era, with their unchecked emissions, posed a significant threat to the environment. The dialogue initiated by advocates like Nader, also paved the way for environmental considerations to become integral to vehicle design and production.